Hello everyone and welcome to this eChurch video for Sunday the 21st of November this year. That's the great feast day of Christ the King that draws to a close the current church year. As usual, we hope and pray that this worship resource will be of help to you as you continue in your life of Christian prayer and discipleship and we do invite your feedback your comments uh, by whatever means is most convenient for you to share them. May God bless you all. Eternal Father, whose Son Jesus Christ ascended to the throne of heaven, that he might rule over all things as Lord and King, keep the church in the unity of the Spirit and in the bond of peace, and bring the whole created order to worship at his feet, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to St John. Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. As I was thinking about what to say for the Feast of Christ the King this weekend, I was reading through my copy of the Word on Fire Bible and came across a reflection um, from Bishop Robert Barron, who is the Bishop of Los Angeles in the Episcopal Church in America. Um, it's a reflection on the gospel reading set for um, this Sunday and also on the Feast of Christ the King. And as I was reading through it, I thought, do you know, I don't think I can do better than that. So I thought I would read to you some of um, Bishop Robert's thoughts on um, this gospel passage and on this great feast. Bishop Robert says this. One of the earliest and most basic forms of Christian proclamation is this. Aesus Kyrios. Jesus is Lord. We tend to think of this claim in religious terms as an indication that Jesus is Lord in a spiritual sense. And it does indeed carry such a meaning. But when the first Christians used the phrase, it had a provocative political overtone as well. For in the ancient world, in the lands surrounding the Mediterranean, Caesar was the Lord, the one to whom ultimate allegiance was owed. Caesar is Lord was a watchword of the time and a proof of loyalty. In saying, therefore, that Jesus is Lord, the early Christians were directly challenging Caesar and all of the powers that operated under his name. It should not be too surprising, then, that Paul spent much of his ministry in jail and that with the exception of John, all of the apostles were martyred and that the church was for three centuries periodically beset by brutal persecution. The enemies of the faith clearly understood what was entailed in the boast that someone crucified by Caesar was in fact the Lord, as has been from the beginning a troublemaking faith. And the public career of Jesus comes to a climax when the Lord confronts Caesar's local representative, the crafty and self-regarding Pontius Pilate. Despite some attempts to romanticise him as a tortured but well-meaning man, Pilate was a fairly typical Roman governor, coldly efficient, concerned with good order, and when necessary, he could be brutal. He once put down a rebellion by nailing hundreds of Jews to the walls of Jerusalem. And like so many of the other political rulers of that time and place, he quite correctly perceived Jesus to be a threat. 
In John's version of the story, when Pilate stands face to face with Jesus, he asks, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers evasively, for he knows what Pilate means by king. One more earthly ruler obsessed with power and all too willing to use violence to preserve it. Then he adds, my kingdom is not of this world. We have to be careful in interpreting this observation because there is always a double meaning to the term world in the Gospel of John. On the one hand, world designates the universe that God has created and that he sustains in love. This is the world that God loved enough to send his son as its saviour. On the other hand, world means the manner of ordering things which is out of step with God's intentions. It indicates a political and cultural realm in which selfishness, hatred, division and violence hold sway. What Jesus implies, therefore, is not that his kingdom is irrelevant to ordinary experience, but that his way of ordering is radically out of step with the way practiced by Caesar, Pilate, Herod and all of the other usual suspects. In short, Jesus' kingdom has everything to do with this world in the first sense of the term and nothing to do with it in the second. Jesus continues, if my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. The mark of the worldly kingdom is violence and the maintenance of order through force and fear. Though it is counterintuitive in the extreme and unrealistic, to say the very least, Jesus' reign will eschew all such means. It will suffer injustice, but it will not perpetuate it. These dynamics of Jesus' kingdom are on full display in the events of Good Friday. Christ the king is crowned and he assumes his throne, but the crown is made of thorns and the throne is a Roman instrument of torture. Three and a half centuries after the New Testament period, Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo Regis on the North Africa seacoast, and a man imbued with the best of Roman culture, wrote a book entitled The City of God heartbroken over the fall of Rome to northern barbaric tribes. This worthy literary successor of Cicero and Cato composed a sustained and vigorous attack on the empire he loved. From the establishment of the city to the present day, Augustine argued, Rome's power had been predicated upon violence and the oppression of the weak by the strong. Roman order was conditioned by a libido dominandi, a lust to dominate, which was in turn supported by the worship of violent, capricious and deeply immoral gods. And this meant, he concluded, that the justice of Rome, trumpeted by its defenders as the very paragon of right order, was in fact a pseudo justice akin to the discipline and purposefulness one might find in a successful gang of robbers. Real order, Augustine continued, will come only when forgiveness, non-violence and the love of enemies are the regnant values, and only when these are supported by the worship of the true God, who is by his very nature, love. There is a direct line that runs from the New Testament to the city of God, for both present the contours of the new kingdom and both pronounce judgment on the old. Bishop Robert says, I have heard rather frequently over the years the suggestion that the kingship of Christ is an outmoded idea, an image alien to our democratic sensibilities, and that consequently we should adopt the language of, say, Christ the president or Christ the prime minister. But this would be counterproductive. We have enormous control over presidents and prime ministers. They must stand regularly before the electorate and can, at the whim of the people, be put out of office. We must, to a large extent, pander to the shifting desires of those who choose them as representatives. We sinners would love just that kind of relationship with Jesus. 
A king, on the other hand, is one to whom total allegiance is due, one who is not subject to the people, but who rather commands and orders them. If the way of Jesus is to prevail over and against the enormous power of the way of the world, he must be acknowledged as king and commander, and we must be willing to march in his army. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. Christ our King, make you faithful and strong to do his will, that you may reign with him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and with everyone that you love and all for whom you pray this holy day and all your days. Amen. <laughs>